Well, hello, Woodman. And congratulations, Rock Rimmon. Uh, this is a weekend when all of our campuses should celebrate with you after what must have felt like two long years at times. Partners in the Gospel wrapped up and finished. The lower level is done. And we... We are so thankful. You know, as, as Pastor Matt, I know, was praying, and then I know he reminded you of his prayers. Uh, it was done on time. It came in under budget, and it has been fully funded through you. Over the past two years, here at Rock Rimmon, you have given $2,526,316. And the final product is beautiful. So if you dropped off a K down to birth kid in Noah's Ark, get up and go get them. <laughs> they are all by themselves. <laughs> Our youngest ones are now close. They're just downstairs. And we are so grateful for your partnership. And I actually hope for our other campuses that what's happened here is an encouragement to you, especially uh, to Heights and Monument who are at various stages of their own Partners in the Gospel initiatives. Uh, hopefully uh, what God did here uh, gives you hope. It is remarkable what God can do through his people. You know, I didn't plan it this way. Um, but what God has done through you actually serves as a great practical illustration uh, for our subject today. Uh, we've been looking at the various ways that God speaks, uh, the different modes that God uses uh, to communicate with us. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the way God speaks through creation. Uh, last weekend, uh, we looked at the way God speaks through his word. Today, we look at maybe is the most surprising God speaks through his people. As imperfect as we are, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord, he desires to use you to communicate the truth of the gospel to the people in this world. You know, this time of year, I think we're all mindful, we're reminded, you know, that Jesus came as a baby. God sent his son to pay the penalty for our sin. What we can forget is that that son, in turn, says to you and me, I'm sending you out to tell others about it. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior, you are a part of this mission. Who, who might God want to speak to through you. I hope as we study that names come to mind, and I pray when we're done, you have some courage uh, to go out and share the good news that brings us here together this morning. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know, Lord, if I think about it too much, I'll, I'll, I'll freak myself out because what I want to do, God, is to see you speak through me. Unfortunately, God, I'm aware of my failures. I know I'm imperfect, and, and it's, it's weighty. And so I ask, I ask for your help now. And God, I, though not every one of us is going to stand up in front, uh, you've called each one of us to speak to somebody. And I pray you'd give them courage too. Uh, none of us are worthy of this message. But you have asked us to go to share and to teach. And so, Father, I pray you'd encourage us toward that end. Help me with the part I now play. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 28 at verse 16. It begins with a call. It begins with a call. Now, what is a little awkward, you know, Christmas and Advent, baby Jesus? We're fast-forwarding right to the end here. So we're just bypassing everything and getting to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. These are the last words that Jesus communicates in the gospel 
of Matthew. It says this, verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. So it was just in verse 10 that Jesus, we saw, uh, his first resurrection appearance was to a bunch of women. And these gals, a little freaked out, risen Lord and all, and Jesus, you know, put their minds at ease. But then Jesus is like, tell the brothers to meet me on Galilee. And Jesus and the disciples were so tight, he doesn't have to be any more specific. <laughs> like, they're all like, oh, we know where that is. Okay, we'll be there. And so the, the gals go, they tell the disciples, they are on their way to Galilee. A journey that was probably taken with, I think we could agree, some excitement, some anticipation, maybe a little trepidation. Last time they were with Jesus, they had been running away. And now he wants to talk to them. It's the first time we get reference not to the 12, but to the 11. Uh, Judas, who'd been numbered among the 12, betrayed Jesus and then took his own life. But as we know, the disciples, they didn't stand with him either. Peter even denying him three times. But their failures did not preclude them from the invitation. And they go to the place that Jesus had appointed. Matthew says what is a little odd. They saw him. They worshipped him. But some doubted. Now the word doubt there is probably too strong in English. It, It conveys more the idea of uncertainty or hesitant. It's used one other time in the New Testament. There's a story told of Peter. Uh, He had been in a boat with the disciples, and Jesus did something a little out of the ordinary. He came walking to them on the water. And Peter, always full of mocks, he said, If it's you, Lord, tell me to come to you. Jesus said, Come. Peter got out there walking on the water, but then he felt the wind, he saw the waves, and he began to sink. And Jesus said, Why do you doubt? Why are you uncertain? Why are you hesitant? That's that's the same word being used here. I think if we're honest, if if we're fair, if we're fair to them, we can appreciate it. You think of maybe if you've ever had that opportunity to meet someone like super famous, an athlete, a musician, or, you know, something, and, and maybe you're like, oh, I don't know what to say. If you can appreciate that in some small measure, uh, the risen Lord who'd been dead and now is standing before you in a glorified body, that's a little, that's different. (laughs) Especially when you had last ran away. Especially when you're not sure if you're up to what he's going to call you to do. I think a lot of times I can find myself and I suspect you're probably not all that different in church and worship you acknowledge him as lord you lift your voice but there's parts of you that i don't know if i can do the thing he's calling me to i'm uncertain how this is going to work out how do i respond in this situation we worship our risen lord and yet in various ways at various times there is some uncertainty While we are 2,000 years removed from this day, what Jesus is going to call the disciples to is the mission you and I as followers are called to as well. But before he tells us the expectation, he reminds them of his power. Look at verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And I think this begins sweet, and it's easy to go past it. It doesn't just say that Jesus said to them. It says that Jesus came and said. Lest you ever think that our God is a God who sits far off in the distance, just barking orders for us to follow, that is not the case at all. Jesus came to these that had run away from him. Jesus comes into their presence, and then he speaks these words of truth and says, All authority has been given me. All authority in heaven and on earth is mine. As the risen Lord, Jesus has been given 
all authority by his Father. Jesus is the sovereign Lord of the universe. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus been demonstrating this. We see the authority Jesus had in the words he said. We, we saw Jesus' authority over demons, over sickness, over death itself. Matthew's Gospel has been ramping up to this point. He began with what isn't like fantastic reading, but a genealogy connecting Jesus to King David. Matthew's the one who records the story of the wise men coming from the east, looking for he who is born king of the Jews. And now the culmination of what Matthew had been seeing unfold before his eyes is said explicitly by the risen Lord. He has all power. Unfortunately, um, it's easy to overlook that, I think, this time of year. So much talk of Jesus, baby Jesus. You look at your little nativity set, it's the smallest one. It's easy to sing the songs and, and forget that that little baby is the sovereign God of the universe in whom all things are held together. It's especially difficult to see knowing the kinds of 2018 some of you have had. You've been looking to him, you've been trusting him, you've been asking him and things haven't gone the way you'd hope. I wish, I wish that I could somehow give you a glimpse of the heavens and Jesus seated firmly at the right hand of God. I wish you could see the times he stands to speak to the Father interceding on your behalf. We do not see him as he is, but make no mistake, he is there. He has the power. And if you're new to this stuff, well, yes, we are thankful that you are here, but you need no. Jesus speaks past tense. All authority in heaven and earth has been given. It's his. And you might not recognize it as such today, but I tell you, one day you most certainly will. There is one day where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. This authority was given him. It's what he possesses. Jesus came as a baby, yes, but he grew up. And he never sinned. And the only reason he made the big journey was to go to the cross to give his life for you. All the naughty things we do, the lies we tell, the the lustful thoughts we have, those pens you steal from your employer. You see woodman pens everywhere. <laughs> Jesus gave his life in our place to reconcile us. One day you'll acknowledge it. I just hope it's not too late. Jesus is going to call his people to something big. And before he does, he reminds them of who he is and the power he has. And then he sends them out on mission. Look at verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Uh, we refer to it as the Great Commission. And these are the marching orders for any one of us that would call upon the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. If you know Jesus, this is what you're supposed to be about. He tells us the end game right in it. The core objective clearly stated, we are to be making disciples. He tells us how that's to happen, and he gives us a hint of what they're supposed to look like once we're done. But there's three parts, and we're called to each. 
And what's funny is I think some of us struggle more with some parts than others. But we're not allowed to really pick and choose. It's not multiple choice. The first one is to go. To go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. To go. The mission you and I are called to is not a passive one. It's an, it's an active one. It, it will involve intentionality for you to do it. And it's such a, like, go. It's a, it's a small word, two letters, and, and we can misunderstand it. Some people make too much of it. Go into the nations, and they're kind of like, well, this is, this is for, like, the pros, the professionals that are going to go overseas. Thankfully, I just live here. No. Uh, this is for all, all of us, regardless of whether you move abroad. We are all to be about getting the gospel to the nations. The gospel of Jesus Christ is for all people, regardless of the color of the skins, the, country, uh, the color of their skin, the country they were born, their socioeconomic status. The gospel is for all. And we are to take it to them. Now, the good news is it's not exclusively us at Woodman that have to get the whole world. We, we share this responsibility with brothers and sisters around the globe. But it is a responsibility we share. I wonder if in 2019 it's going to be the year you go and you move and you live somewhere else for the sake of the gospel. If you've been around, my, you, I would love it if you did. Not that I don't like you and want you to leave. But I, I, I just, sometimes, sometimes I want to go. And it would be great if God put that on your heart. You might not go, but you can give. Support those. Help those that are leaving Christmas Eve. Every dollar we take is going to leave this place. Supporting Cure International. Meeting spiritual needs, meeting physical needs in the lives of people who otherwise might not get those needs met. Maybe you can't give, but we all could pray. We are to go. We make too much of it if we think it's just for missionaries, but we make too little of it if we don't think it means anything. We have to go somewhere. We are not called to just wait i think some people have an idea that if i'm i just have to if i live my christian life if i do the things god wants me to he's going to bring people into my life they're going to ask questions jesus could have said all authority in heaven and earth is mine all you got to do is sit tight but he didn't say that he said so you're gonna have to go it may just be across your street it may be just to the cubicle next to you But it has to be intentional. We need to go to neighbors. We need to go to friends. Who might God send you to? Who might you know? Who might God bring into your path? What would it look like if just these next few days in the Advent season, if you started each day with a God, I'm available. Got some things on my list. But what, what, what is on yours? Is there a person? Is there a family? Who could I intentionally go to so that you could speak through me today? We are to go. Second thing we're called to do is to share. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Baptizing them. Baptism is where we make a public declaration and identification with the person and work of Jesus Christ. And then what is a little odd if you're new to this, we, 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 we dunk you underwater. It's only like 15 seconds. Sometimes I count to 20 just to make sure it takes... But usually we can get it done in 12. No, you, 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 stand, you stand in water. 
and you share your testimony of what Jesus Christ has done for you, and then we put you under and we bring you up in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what baptism is, and that's what Jesus commands us to do. We are to go and make disciples and baptize them. So this assumes three things. Number one, it's assuming what? That we're sharing the gospel because people can't be baptized unless they've confess Christ as Lord, and they can't confess Christ as Lord unless someone has told them they need to. So this is assuming that when we go into the world, when we go across the street, when we go into the next cubicle, we are sharing some words. People need to know the way they're to go. Second thing it assumes is a measure of success when we do. Jesus doesn't simply say, go and share. He says, go and baptize. So he knows, and he's told us that there's going to be sometimes we throw it out there and nobody takes. But he says, there are times when they do. And when they acknowledge Christ as Savior, dunk them. Now, uh, this is meant to be an encouragement to, for us to go out and do the things Jesus has called us to. But just as sort of a, a separate issue, I want to just, I know some of you have been trying very hard and praying very long and being very faithful to share the gospel. And there's loved ones and family members and dear souls in your life that have not responded that is hard now the thing about this directive the thing about his command is he doesn't put any times on it doesn't say go for two months or go for three doesn't say go for seven years or go for two days just go make disciples baptize doesn't say how many baptize before you quit doesn't say how many you expect in your first year share and if you have been and you're not seeing the response if nothing else I just want you to hear do not grow weary in doing good keep at it and as um, as you share you and I do not need to, when we talk about sharing the gospel with people, yes, there are times when you're going to like lay it out, spell it out, call. Call the question. But there are other times when you can actually just share your Christian life with them. We have this weird way of separating the spiritual and the secular And we needn't do that. How many times have you, you went to church, your kids did some event at church, and you served at some place on the weekend, and you went to work on Monday, people say, how was your weekend? Good. What'd you do? Nothing. Could be because you're embarrassed. Could be because you don't realize how special your weekend was and different than the one that they had. You could say, <laughs> well, a long weekend this weekend, actually. Did a lot of stuff at church. My wife's got a servant and kids. I don't even like them. <laughs> but I was there, you know. You could. Have you ever been studying God's word? Or, or you're in community group. You feel like there's something that you need to do. You need to respond to it. There's someone you need to apologize to at work. And you go in and you say, we need to talk. I want to say I'm sorry. You could say, hey, this is sort of weird. I, I think you know, like, we're, I'm, I'm a Christian. And I try to read the Bible. I don't do it all the time. I try to what God wants me. I was doing my thing the other day, and I was reading this passage, and, it, and, and I realized I did the very thing my, my guys asked me not to do. I, I want to ask you if you'd forgive me. Just to bring your Christian life 
and like open the curtain on, on who you are and what makes you different. It's not always a gear up, seven weeks of preparation, throw it down. Sometimes call the question. Other times just share. Third thing this assumes though, this directive to go and baptize, is that if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been baptized or you're making plans to do it ASAP. Do you know Jesus, but you've not been baptized? I know it's just a product of my, like my line of work, my chosen profession, but I hear a lot of reasons why people don't want to get baptized. Uh, some is just the talking in front of people freaks you out. Believe it or not, I get that. Others, I mean, just the like, so I got to get like in shorts and a t-shirt and like get wet in my hair and like Makeup, that's not for everybody, but it's like some people, that's a deal. You know, I, I get that. Others are a little more spicy, and they're like, well, do I need to be baptized to be saved? The answer is no. If you've confessed Christ as Lord and asked him to forgive you your sin, you are saved. We talked last weekend about that dude dying on the cross beside Jesus, said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, and Jesus today will be with me in paradise. That guy was not dunked, and he's there. So if you know Jesus, you don't need to be baptized to get to heaven. But if you know Jesus, you're going to be in heaven. And just be forewarned, Jesus might ask you why you didn't do one of the things he asked you to do. He wants you to make that public declaration. He wants you to identify with him. And if you know Jesus as Savior, you could do it. Do you need to? Maybe, maybe that's a 2019 easy goal that you could check off. We are to go into the nations where we are to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice that great sort of early Trinitarian reference. What else are we supposed to do? Teaching them. We're to teach them to observe all that he has commanded. It's not simply that we are to get people saved and baptized. We are to teach them and disciple them when they have committed their lives to Christ. We are to want them to live the life Jesus is asking them to live, which means all of our time in this book, all of our time spent studying and learning, it's not merely an intellectual pursuit. The purpose of the teaching, the purpose of the learning is so that it makes a difference in our daily lives. There are people who know tons about what the book says. They just, it makes no practical difference in the way they live. That is not what we're going after. Jesus tells us to teach people so that they can observe all that he had commanded them to do. Uh, this is why... Um, why we spend an inordinate amount of time, when you think of all the stuff we do in a service, to this part. Because there's things in this book we need to know, and, and there's some uncomfortable things in this book that we probably wouldn't get to unless someone else like, stood up and talked to us about it. This is why we have community groups. Because some of the stuff in this book is actually hard to do, and we want you to have people to encourage you. We want you to be able to encourage others. It's why we have Woodman U. Because there's some stuff that you need to know now. And he's like going back to Mark. I don't need that. I need something else. And we want you to have an opportunity to get the content that you need. Because we need to learn and live so that we can teach others. Ezra 7.10 is one of my favorite verses and probably in large part, I think, as to why we named our youngest son Ezra. But Ezra 7.10 says, Ezra set his heart to learn God's law, to do it, 
and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Ezra set his heart to know what God wanted, to do it himself, and to teach others. If you're in the market for a life verse, that's good. I mean, get grandma to crochet it, put it on your dashboard. That would be... Imagine... If across the board, we desire to know what God wanted to do it and then to tell others. I realize that it sounded funny me talking about it because I stand up here and I get to talk longer than maybe you'd like. But this isn't just teaching here. It's telling your kids. Uh, unpacking for coworkers. You, you, you know, it's not like God has times of the year that he does more, like, stuff than others. He's pretty, like, good all year round. But if you're anxious about sharing the gospel, if you're, if you're nervous about it, for us, this time of year is incredible. Most people in our culture know that something happens on December 25th. But not everybody in our culture knows why it's so special. You could begin to teach by that Christmas party you got planned for next Tuesday. You say, hey, you know what? We're so glad to have you here. We're just going to have dinner. But like, you know, one of the things that we do in our family, we're just going to hope this doesn't wake you. I just want to, we always read the Christmas story. It's in Luke 2. Would you guys mind if I just read it? Uh, to, to, to have conversations. As people talk about the things they're getting and the credit card they're amassing, we talk about actually the greatest gift that you've ever gotten. Cost you nothing. We all have opportunity to teach. Who might he be calling you to teach? We are to be sent out to go, to share, and to teach others. And sometimes it's just not all that complex. There's a guy in my community group, and he um, owns his own business, so he gets to work in like coffee shops and fun places a lot. And he was in one. And I don't know why this is. He doesn't look particularly techy, but a, a, a gal came up to him and asked him if, if he would help her with her computer. Okay, and he actually did, which I think is remarkable. He helped her fix the problem. And, and, and she went away, and for him, that was, I think, just like a little random act of kindness that day. But he'd gone to the same coffee shop, and another day she comes up and again says, hey, you helped me before. Would you help me again? And see, the thing was, he wasn't content to leave it on the random act of kindness page anymore. And I don't know how the guy got from, like, fix my computer to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he did. He shared of God's grace. She said, it's just a bunch of rules. He says, no, it's not. You don't understand. She shared of her hesitancy, having been to churches, and she said she felt so alone. He's like, well, you know what? Come with my wife and I. You won't be. There are going to be times when we share the gospel on purpose because we're going out to do it, but then there's going to be other times when we're on mission because we started the day reminding ourselves that we are and just being available to speak, to share and to teach. And when we do, be assured of his promise Look at how Jesus concludes this for them. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus knew of their hesitancy. Jesus knew of their uncertainty. Jesus knew of their doubt. And he wants them to know, as you go, I will always be with you. Every time you share, and we're going to talk about this more next weekend, the spirit of the living God, if you know Christ and you share the gospel, not only is he with you, but he can give weight to your words to make them fall on someone's heart in a real way. You and I do not go alone. He promises his abiding presence with us. Now, we do not have time for this, but it's one of the head scratchers. Jesus says, I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. What's funny, Jesus just affirmed that he's part of the Godhead, and yet Jesus doesn't know when the end is. Disciples were asking about it. He goes, that's the Father's call. It's not mine. 
But one day, it will be the last day. And why is he waiting? 2 Peter 3.9 says that God is not slow as some count slowness. He's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is working through his church to draw men and women, students and kids to himself. But what is an overwhelming thought to kind of wrap your head around is there is going to be one day when someone will confess Christ as Lord and they will be the last person to do so. And God's going to say, that's it. I don't know how God has heaven organized. Like I haven't been there, but angels, the sun, I mean, are they, they must be in a constant state of readiness. They don't know. But we're also told there's rejoicing in heaven every time someone comes to faith, right? So picture the, the celebration. Someone came to faith. I don't know, they're high five. Do they have a song? I don't know what they do. Yeah, like, but they're, they're, they're celebrating. And on one day, there will be a day. And God's like, that's it. Go. And that one angel's going to be, is this a drill? Is this a drill? Right? And it's going to be done. The end of the age will come. And God knows who that person is. Now, I'm not going to try to be sentimental and be like, you might be the last person to share the gospel with the last person and have that like on a badge for eternity. (laughs) Obviously, I can't say that'll be you. But I can say if you never share the gospel with anyone, you got no chance that it could be. A lot of times we're kind of like magpies, you know, anything shiny catches our attention and pulls us away. But this, this is what we're called to to share the gospel in confidence that he is with us. Who might he be calling you to speak to, to share with, to teach? And what might God do through someone as imperfect as you, imperfect as me, when we're faithful to be about the thing he's asked us to be. If you have a name on your heart, what's it going to look like? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I imagine that um, a lot of us here are are probably like me in in that it's not opportunities I lack. It's just the confidence to take, take them. Lord, in all the things we get to enjoy in this world, I pray that you would keep us mindful of the reason you've got us on it. Lord, I pray that you would give us a confidence I pray that you would give us encouragement. And Lord, I pray that you would grow in us hope, especially for those who've been sharing and witnessing and not seeing much fruit. Would they, I pray, God, not grow weary in it. But Lord, at this time of year, with with, with Christmas Eve around the corner, with Lord, would you draw many people to faith? not simply through the men and women, students and kids of Woodman, but God in our city, through other brothers and sisters, would your name be high and lifted up? Would you use us toward that end? In Jesus' name, amen.